Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Xuning Li. I'm a associate professor at uh, MD Anderson Cancer Center in Houston, Texas. I'm a thoracic medical oncologist. So join me today, there are two experts, one from China and the one from the United States. Uh, the first one is Dr. Elon Wu. He's very famous. He's a director of Guangdong Province uh, People's Hospital, and he's also from Guangdong Lung Cancer Institute. Our US expert is Dr. Sandeep Patel. He is a professor of medicine at University of California, San Diego. So welcome. Thank you. So today we're speaking at the 2024 ASCO annual meeting in Chicago. It's a really busy meeting, and then we have a lot of new exciting data reported out for target therapy, especially in lung cancer space. So let me begin to talk about some of the data that we have recently seen. Uh, I will try to group them into uh, topics so that we can have a more informed discussion. So first of all, let's dive into the ADC data that we saw very recently, uh, three back-to-back -back presentations. Uh, Sandeep, can you please give us a, a quick summary of the results we saw? Absolutely. And so I think we've had really a renaissance in antibody drug conjugates. These are antibodies through novel linker chemistry, have multiple cytotoxic payloads delivering chemotherapy directly uh, to the tumor. We have multiple different uh, combination studies uh, that we saw today in thoracic oncology. Uh, the first was um, the Icarus Long 01 study. Uh, this was looking at uh, datapotamab, which is a trope 2 targeting um, ADC. And this is really around the biomarker story. Uh, because one of the things is, while for antibodies, we have reasonable biomarkers for uh, immunohistochemistry, for example, uh, for antibody drug conjugates, the biomarker story really hasn't been that clean. Even for HER2, HER2 negative patients can respond. Um, and so this is really an effort at, at describing and better understanding the biomarker story for datapotamab and lung cancer. And I congratulate the investigators uh, on some really interesting correlative work, which may uh, define future biomarker selection for studies. We also had an antibody drug conjugate uh, and a P1 combination, the Evoco-1 study, this is going to sacrituzumab uh, govotekin. Uh, this is used in breast cancer in the United States, uh, bladder cancer, and now being investigated in non-small cell lung cancer. And we saw some provocative data in combination um, with a, a PD-1 antibody, especially in PD-1 negative patients. And so is this an opportunity to make cold tumors hot, so to speak? Um, and then the Optotrope uh, Lung 01 study, uh, which is a next generation uh, trope 2 um, ADC from Asia uh, that's combined with a PD-1 inhibitor, uh, in my opinion, should really uh, interesting data across PDL one strata. Um, and I'm looking forward to seeing uh, how this data translates to the benefit um, of patients. What are some of the antibody approaches you're most excited about in your clinic? You know, uh, can you please make a comment on how, how's your experience with ADC and do you think ADC will be just the hype, and then later on uh, become not as exciting over time. So I think the uh, no doubt the ADC is a very topic in the, uh, the the oncology field, mm -hmm. especially for the lung cancer and the breast cancer. So far, we also know the very successful the ADC drug, her to the ADC drug. Mm -hmm. They are very successful in the breast cancer and the lung cancer. And, and the tumor is not is not sick, yeah. But mm -hmm. then, very interesting. We then why only the her to the ADC successful, the other unsuccessful. I think this is very important. So I. So I, I, I don't know why the, the other the ADC is not so successful, but I think maybe one of the reason the ADC is the target population. It's an antibody and the target, yes. but the role, the real role the, for kill the cell is a pilot. Yes. The pilot is the cytosis. So I think we have the target population, but the finally we have the unsolicited population. Right? So I think yeah, so maybe, there's a mismatch yeah, over there. So that yeah. maybe the, the one the reason why so many the ADC drugs so far we had the, the under our the expectancy. Yeah. So uh uh, Sandeep, what do you think about the promising data that the TROP2 ADC from Asia in combination with the PD-1 in the frontline setting, uh, I, I think that data 
itself looks numerically look very exciting. You think combination with immune will be the direction to go? I think so. I think the concerns around their emergent toxicities from antibody drug conjugates, including lung toxicities such as ILD, and how to deconvolute these uh, from immune pneumonitis, I think is going to be very important. Uh, we know from small molecule EGFR inhibitors, combining those with PD-1 has led to high rates of pneumonitis. And so how do we avoid that as we deal with monoclonal-based strategies, I think is, is going to be key. Um, the other thought, I think this is a great point, is the biomarkers for ADCs don't seem to uh, predict response as well as biomarkers for the bland antibody. And so there's some sort of synergy from this kind of bystander payload effect that we don't yet have a biomarker to measure. Yeah, absolutely. That needs more research going forward, right? So I have the, 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 one of the issues for uh, the long spread. Uh, when the small molecule meet ADC for the, uh, the, the, the driver gene the maintenance mm -hmm. function. Yeah. So what do you see about this? Yeah, so yeah. There's a yeah, so I think uh, people are excited about their ongoing clinical trials, mm -hmm. basically double blockade, double targeting. Um, I'm looking forward to see both efficacy and the toxicity, because the on-target toxicity, for example, for HER2, cardiac issues, and we'll have to see the data. Yeah, I always think the very important, we are always to see the efficacy and the toxicity and the balance. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Uh, so let's move on to a more specific uh, patient population. Uh, so yesterday and going forward, we'll hear about uh, EGFR mutation related uh, uh, progress in the field. Uh, as you know, EGFR mutation happens in Asian population more significantly. Now we not only have small molecule inhibitor, we start to see that by specific antibody, maybe some immune modulation going to that space. So Sandeep, can you give us a brief update of what we see this time in ASCO. Yeah, Juning, I think it's been a very exciting time uh, in EGFR biology. I think one point is we can't treat these patients successfully if we don't test and do appropriate molecular testing. And to me, there's at least three groupings of EGFR mutations, your canonical mutations, exon 19, L858R, of course, your institution has done a lot of work on this. Um, secondarily, exon 20 insertion mutations. Yes. And then third are the atypical mutations, often in exon 18, and sometimes these are compound. And so it's important uh, to give not only the street name, but the full address. It's not enough to say someone's EGFR positive anymore, because that doesn't give us enough information, because there's so many therapeutic strategies, as you nicely um, summarized. I think the bispecific, um, in particular amivantamab, which is an EGFR uh, met bispecific, we saw multiple interesting data sets. Probably the most instantly um, practical is the results of Paloma, which yeah. suggest that a subcutaneous version of amivantamab, which has an easier infusion schedule, less than five minutes, rather than the five hours with less infusion reactions and potentially less BTE because of yeah. less infusion reactions, I think is a day one uh, change that's going to happen. And I think we saw some really provocative data um, around atypical mutations yes. and combinations of imivantamab and lazertinib, lazertinib being a small molecule EGFR inhibitor, uh, because many times patients with atypical mutations, if they're treated with the current FDA-approved therapy of fatinib, especially for the PAC mutations, which you're mm -hmm. well aware of, um, brain metastasis can be an issue, and lazertinib is a CNS-penetrant um, EGFR mutation. We also saw the Mariposa frontline data uh, this is for canonical EGFR exon 19 L85 mutations, um, uh, amivantamab, lozertinib versus osimertinib, showing a PFS benefit across all subgroups. Uh, but I think it's going to be interesting to see how the overall survival data emerges there, especially because so many patients in the U.S. go from osimertinib to chemotherapy plus amivantamab in that setting. Yeah, thank you so much. A lot of advance. So, uh, Elon, um, amivantamab, is it available in China yet? That's a naive question. So the not yet the AB one is not yet in the China not good. But when we are look at the, all the data we have seen in the EGR mutant patient, mm -hmm. now we maybe we have the two the direction to develop. One is the combination mm -hmm. for the in the phone like the such a floral hole, such the menopausal. Yeah. The, the second uh, we target the, the, the EGRT catch with failure patient. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. this is the harmonia and yeah. also another the IO in the uh, failure the patient. But when we look at the the the, the, the research, we find that if the, we are in the frontline the combination, we are 
maybe we are uh, at a certain toxicity to get the salt the, the PLS. And we also know the how about the overstabbing. Yes. So yes. I think in this situation, in my mind, and also in most of the patients, we, we, we don't also like the combination with the very toxicity of the drug. So, so this is one point. The second point, I think after EGF radio, I mm -hmm. think the resistance mechanism for very, very complex. We are increasing the 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 so called untargeted mutations, yes. the CM, the the TCMDN, the CMDAs, the all the injured implication. And another, we are also under the so called bypass. Yes. Yeah. So the CMED, uh, the implication. When we are find the CMED implication, the I think the treatment strategy is the EGRT cap part of the CMED mm -hmm. inhibitor. Mm -hmm. And also, maybe some patients translation to small cell lymphocytes there. So, very, very complex. In this complex situation, when we are using one of the model to treat the application, I, I have to know, I have to send the doubt that <laughs> this is a successful or not. Yep. But I think for the harmony I want A or the uh, another so I said the 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 all in the three one and also the Atra or mm -hmm. the, uh, another I think maybe they're only surprise one person for us in this the uh, mutant. Yes, absolutely. So Sandeep, can you uh, also make a little bit comment, the follow up on Elon's discussion of tox and the efficacy benefit, high risk biomarker. Mm -hmm. We heard a little bit about that. Can you please comment on how you feel about that data? Yeah, and so there are multiple high risk biomarkers. Mm -hmm. um, uh, some of these are static, for example, baseline presence of P53. Yep. Um, others are more dynamic. For example, um, after a month of treatment, you still shed circulating uh, tumor DNA at a high level. Um, I, I think when we think about these high risk groups for canonical EGFR mutations, thinking about intensification strategies may be important. Now, whether it's these baseline factors or it's these dynamic factors after a month, I think we have some studies that we're remaining to see. Um, Janine, I'd love to hear, you know, we talked a lot about EGFR met by specifics, and I think that's a very hot area based on the biology, but we've also seen some bispecifics that are immune mediated, for example, VEGF PD1 targeting. Um, and I'd love to hear your thoughts. This actually, we've had a history of VEGF targeting in EGFR mutations. What are your thoughts on the Harmony A study and these kinds of approaches? Yeah, so this year, Dr. Zhang Li, also from Guangzhou, uh, reported Harmony uh, China data. So those are the population uh, post EGFR TKI, and the, the patient need chemo. The comparator arm is chemo, but the experimental is chemo plus a bispecific PDL1 and the VEGF, the study is positive, hazard ratio is less than 0 0.5, so it shows a high promise. And even the OS demonstrated a trend towards improvement of uh, uh, the benefit. So I personally think it is a, a very valid strategy for patients after TKI failure. Uh, toxicity is very well tolerated. Uh, I think we probably is facing after TKI resistance, we probably should filter out the uh, driver re related mutations. For example, a fusion or just like Dr. Elon was talking about EGFR secondary mutation and met amplification. But for the rest of the patient, majority, we don't know their resistance mechanism. I think a blanket approach capture all is, is reasonable. And then in the US, we also have to interpret that data with uh, Mariposa 2. So that's chemo plus uh, amivantamab currently going through a regulatory process. So patients have more options, which is good. Yeah. 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 So let's move on to a different uh, patient population. Uh, this is AUK and the ROS rearranged uh, lung cancer. Uh, in the AUK space, we have been seeing uh, a good a collection of uh, TKIs to help patients. And then uh, very impressively this year, Crown Data updated their five-year report. Sandeep, if you can give us a summary of what's the results. And then Elon, please comment on, are you excited or how excited are you? <laughs> Absolutely, and I thought it was a really great presentation. Um, sometimes uh, you see only new data, 
Uh, this data was so good at the five-year mark, it basically got represented as an oral. So Crown Phase 3 International Study of Lorlatinib uh, versus Crizotinib in the frontline setting uh, for patients with metastatic ALK rearranged non-small cell lung cancer. And this is a drug that has been approved in the United States for use. Um, it's had really phenomenal data, in my opinion, in the CNS in particular, mm -hmm. both in terms of treatment as well as prevention, uh, with, with some of the best hazard ratios we've seen of any uh, targeted therapy um, approach. Yes. Uh, there are certain neurocognitive side effect issues that folks have to be aware of, and dose adjustments can mitigate those. Um, but I've not found them to be a major headwind in my practice once you realize you can make dose adjustments and you educate the patients to, to be aware of them. But I really thought, uh, you know, what's old is new again. And I think um, we, we saw a lot of excitement around this data um, because our ability to generate small molecule inhibitors against fusions, this is one of the, the better targets that we've seen and the better drugs that we've seen in that setting. And, and the ability to prevent brain metastasis is really a devastating um, side effect for these patients, I think, was key. And we also saw some additional data um, with lorlatinib uh, in, in the ROS1 setting. Um, so Alqua and ROS1 are very similar uh, in terms of where they are in the kind of targeting. And so the drugs that target are very similar as well. And so the ability to have a CNS penetrant um, TKI uh, that has this durability of response um, is, is, is really provocative and I think something folks need to consider. And as they're thinking about managing toxicities, awareness and dose reductions can be key. Um, but I'd love to hear, um, we, have met, we have a wealth of riches in the ALK space with multiple potent inhibitors, electinib, brigadinib, lorlatinib. Uh, what is your approach to these? And patients? also in China, yeah. we have instartinib, right? Okay. Yeah. So I think the Find the study is very, very exciting. So I think first, we are only one the simple drug, all of simple drugs. I know. For more than five years. Yeah, the median the has no reach. So I think this means, what, what means this? I think we meet the, for the all confusion patient. This really became the chronic disease. Absolutely. Even the PFS is now hitting five-year yeah. mark. They, really, this is a beautiful example of how precision oncology can really impact our lung cancer patients' life. And the ALK patients, they are generally diagnosed very young. Yeah. So this is really just really game changer for the entire space. And the second point, I think the very interesting or the very important about the brain metastasis. So the, uh, the relative either treated the brain metastasis or the free mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so the data show that without the, the, the brain metastasis at the baseline, by year, the, 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 it's almost the, a flat. The, almost yeah. 90, yeah. Almost the 90% patient. Mm -hmm. So I think it's a prevent. So, Elon, let me ask you this. Um, do you think EGFR will ultimately, and other, for example, KRAS, for example, BRAF, ultimately we will have better TKI to just be like ALK. Do you think that will truly be the case? Mm, I think maybe this is related to the biology for this the spatial, the, the, the subtype of lung cancer. So uh, in generally, we are called the uh, ALK fusion, so-called diamond mutation. Why oh. this Because we have the very good methods to treat this yeah. cancer. Yeah. So so finally I think con the study showed that even the five year that the old the, the drug mm -hmm. happened, but the side effect is under control. Yes. We are very worried about the brain, the the cognitive. Thing. But yeah. now we are so oh, okay, this is okay. Not not so worried about that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. well, I think this is the amazing the result. Yeah. But based on the result, we also consider maybe some patient with the RCU. When could we have the, the drug holiday? We need to consider maybe ten years also. If, yeah, I, I, I don't know, because I think it's a mixed feeling, right? Like, yeah. also, I think patients are so 
de uh, psychologically dependent on the drug. I don't have any single patient ever miss a pill for either ARC or EGFR. So they're like, that's their safety blanket. Absolutely. And Jing, I'd love to hear your thoughts. Um, some of the molecular, we talk about the brain metastasis, so clinical selection. Uh, but in the crown data, they showed V3. So there are three variants for ALK, yeah. of which V3 is a more aggressive phenotype, more resistant phenotype historically. Uh, there's also some data on P53, which is one of the historic higher risk mutations. Uh, do you have uh, a genomic assay? And do you think it's important to consider those molecular aberrations as we think about which ALK small molecule inhibitor to utilize? Oh, currently I'm not because I'm going. I'm using lolotinib frontline for my patients, um, and then I felt like also over time the TKI are so potent. Uh, for example, in the EGFR space, uh, newer TKI they can hit exon twenty both near loop and the far loop. So some of those distinction. Uh, might be not as important clinically compared to preclinical understanding nowadays. However, P53 is still a uh, bad player. Uh, we are seeing some of the phase one data uh, trying to mitigate TP53 MDM2 pathway. So maybe one day we'll do some combination or interval chain uh, treatment. That, that will be very interesting as well. Yeah, I think the, the, the in, maybe in the future we have the two uh, reshoot dilation. First, even the, the PMS the not reached, but we also find that in the two year, over the 30% of the patient also be left. Yeah. So I think maybe the next the, the direction we need uh, through the biological, bioinformatic, the to analyze it, which patient not so good that is possible. And then for this patient, we are give the uh, the strong treatment. Yeah. Uh, another thing that we are thinking maybe that why some patient the 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 living longer with, with without the relapse. Mm -hmm. Maybe what is the patient after the three or the four year we give the patient drug or all the time. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sandeep, what's your final comments? I think Elon talked about the drug holiday, talk about high-risk patients. What's your final comment? Yeah, I think we're all going to need a holiday after seeing all the great data in our skills. It really is, is you know, drinking from a fire hose, but it's important for our patients. And it's important for patients to see how much progress we've made. The mortality for cancer has decreased in the United States and worldwide over the past several years. And it's due to precision oncology, particularly in lung cancer, which is the biggest killer uh, mm -hmm. amongst diseases. And so uh, I think when we're talking about these abstracts, it's important to understand that patients go on these studies and they volunteer at a point in their lives that they're really vulnerable. And, and, and to see that that translated into benefit for other patients and hopefully themselves and others is key. And I think a lot of this is driven by precision oncology methods. Absolutely. And so the ability to do molecular testing, either as a liquid biopsy or tissue biopsy, it's just so key. We wouldn't treat breast cancer without knowing ERPR HER2. We can't treat non-small cell lung cancer without knowing the molecular profile. Exactly. And this is, a, I think, a global issue as much as it is uh, an issue in the US. And I think artificial intelligence, digital pathology will hopefully liberalize some of these as well. But it's an exciting meeting. It's been exciting discussing all these um, late-breaking um, abstracts and, and things that I want to take back to clinic and try to utilize it with y'all. And what are your final thoughts? Oh, so I, I do feel like lung cancer, both incidence and the mortality are decreasing globally, which is fantastic. But I start to encounter some of the younger patients in the clinic. Uh, so I think that's a trend for some of other solid tumor as well. So I just want even younger patients to be aware. And then I think we're moving to earlier and earlier uh, discovery and the screening. So I hope uh, we can one day cure cancer or uh, having lung cancer as a chronic disease with us. Uh, thank you for joining us today. So this is Xuning Li, Sandeep Patel, Elon Wu. We are speaking from 2024 ASCO annual meeting in Chicago. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you.